I like to find partners that have been through failure and I can see evidence of how they were during failure and, and how they came out of it. So good morning and welcome to another episode of Better Business, Better Life. Today, I am joined by Patrick Grimes, who is joining us from Southern California. And Patrick is a CEO and founder of Invest on Main Street, which is um, a, a real estate investment firm. But he's also the, co- the co-author of Amazon number one best-selling book, Persistence, Pivots and Game Changers, Turning Challenges into Opportunities. So some really interesting things we've been talking about this morning. Welcome to the show, Patrick. I'm excited to be here. Really cool show. And I hope I can add some value to your listeners. I have no doubt you'll be able to do that. I'm really looking forward to you sharing your story with us. So um, I've been having a quick chat to Patrick beforehand, and I'm actually going to hand it over to him and say, hey, Patrick, tell us a little bit about your, your life so far, how you got into the business you're in, how it's got to where it is today, and what are the things you're most proud of on that journey as well? Well, so I, I actually come back from an engineering background. I started as a mechanical engineer and then proceeded to get a master's in engineering and, and, and an MBA. Meanwhile, I was doing real estate. Actually, the first automation house I worked for, the owner said, hey, you should invest in real estate as soon as you can and as much as you can. Uh, and I did that uh, aggressively. And then I lost it all in eight, nine, and 10. <laughs> so, I mean, I, had, I was going big, big gambles on what I thought were great bets. And as it turns out, I, I didn't understand the basic principles of long-term volatility and building a, a, a investment portfolio to last. And so that, that definitely shifted my trajectory and probably <laughs> made us successful to where we are today in a private equity firm at over $500 million. Yeah, great. And so what, so you obviously got you know, encouraged to go into it early, but um, I mean, it's sad that you kind of lost it all, but you must have had some huge lessons from that. What were the lessons that you took from that experience. Yeah. So I guess the, the lessons are kind of two step. My, in that time, I, I had really wanted to be the hare and not the tortoise from the tortoise and the hare. Mm-hmm. I had done due diligence and looked at investments and thought, well, Hey, look, I'm a busy professional. I need to invest moonlight my investments uh, and do it myself. And, and I started it, it, investments that would try and double, triple my money every couple of years. Right. And there's a certain risk profile associated with those. And mm-hmm. not only did were those years that potentially I, I lost a lot, but I had personally guaranteed loans that were fully recourse. So they came after me and it took me not a couple of years. Uh, it took me, you know, four or five years to recover from, from that incident. And then, so on the other side of it, I was humbled. You know, I wasn't as uh, cocky or arrogant or, or bold. I was back to engineering. I, I, if there's any engineers on this call, I cranked up the safety factor <laughs> of my designed uh, investments. Started doing things with um, in recession resilient markets. I learned all about recession resilient markets, ones that have diversified employment, which allowed for uh, that allow for recessions to happen and they bounce back quickly or stay sustained. You know, healthcare, finance, logistics, things that are not fleeting. And ones that have the many of those parallels, like the Houston, some some belt locations where we invest today. And then I learned about assets that cash flow and that can ride out recessions and how to structure those deals so they're safe from rising interest rates and inflation and uh, and finding the right investors that'll partner with me. I think there was a lot there in the patience that I learned. It took me almost two and a half years after I decided to get into larger apartments uh, to really learn the business. A little analysis paralysis as an engineer, but, you know, in that time it paid off. Hmm, certainly. And so your portfolio is, is commercial real estate. And I know a lot of people very easily invest in residential and have their, you know, their additional income coming from that. But the commercial estate business, um, it's, it's quite different, isn't it? Tell us a little bit about, you know, why would you invest in commercial versus residential? Well, when I came crawling out of 2008, 9, and 10, and I started doing large bonuses again in my automation robotics career in engineering, I started uh, needing a place to dump my bonuses. And so in, I used all my own capital, started buying distressed properties in recession-resilient markets, and those were single family because I could do it all myself. Mm-hmm. And, and it worked. I, I was able to build a team um, afar from afar out of California, Find properties, renovate them with contractors, property managers, lease them up, refi out my investments, and then roll into the next. The challenge was that I was trading my time. I was moonlighting it. I, my, my family, friends, and hobbies were taking a hit. My overall stress level from a very demanding job was, and I was trying to do it all myself. 
when I realized when I met my wife or soon to be wife, she was actually there for my very last closing. And that's when I decided she was there. And I said, look, this is the last one. She's like, really, what are you going to do? And I was like, well, I'm going to do, I think I'm going to do apartments. I've been researching a lot. You can partner up through scale and, and you can move into commercial assets that are not recourse debts, long at large enough buildings at cash flow, and the banks will give you attractive debt safer, right? Buildings that you can have vacancies and you don't lose hundred percent of your revenue. Yeah. And those vacancies can be so low and still pay your bills that it'll write out a recession if you're in the right assets. And so I started having all these conversations and we realized that commercial was the way to go and it's more of a financial institution. So I started mm-hmm. building a business uh, where we could have on-site property management. I could work with commercial brokers, get the right kind of debt. And then we got into our first property and I haven't looked back. Excellent. So how many staff do you have in the team now? And, and where, where are they based? Because you've mentioned you're doing it all remotely from, from California. Tell me a little bit about the structure of the business now and what that looks like. I'm um, thinking about my website has, it highlights probably, I don't know, 15, I think, on our team's page. And we're since we're doing a diversified portfolio of income generating real estate on the real estate side, and we also do oil and gas as well. And generationally, mm-hmm. my family's been involved in that. So, But on the real estate side, you know, we ha- I think we have, uh, depending upon the partners that we work with in different areas, um, we have about that many within the purview of with directly under invest on main street and through other entities and the asset management and property management side. And on property management side, there's hundreds um, on the vertically integrated and that's a completely different business and you need a different partner, somebody who's very process oriented and taking things from 95 to hundred percent, not somebody like me, who's the entrepreneur innovator that's looking for the next creative structure, the next discounted buy, you know, and then chasing it and trying to design something and create it. Um, so it's a very different business, but on the private equity side, that's, that's how that structure works. So you're really the visionary in the business, aren't you? You're the person who's got the big ideas that goes out there and sort of changes the way things are done, but you're not necessarily the person who's good at the, the background follow-up and making sure everything is, the all the boxes are ticked. Is that right? Well, once it's over the finish line, you know, a lot of the heavy lifting mentally has been done. And then, yeah. and once we get to take over of the properties, then at that point, you need to plug in a really solid process guy that takes, mm-hmm. I, I, the analogy I like to make is when I worked at the plant, I used to do work at Tesla or Lockheed. So I did work at Toyota where it Tes- became Tesla later. And the, the Japanese plant would, there was guys that would work their entire lives on a piece of the windshield molding and prevent wind noise, right? And that's a process guy that's going to go from 95 to 96, 97, 98. And he measures success in those kinds of sustained process, you know, standardization procedures. Uh, but uh, I can't do that. <laughs> I'm more in. I'm more in. The, let's figure out the next generation of the next model vehicle, right? Yeah. And disrupt this. Way. And where can I find the lowest risk business for my investors for the future and the best haven for their capital that'll give us the best risk adjusted return? And then plug in, you know, those other people that are those process people. And I guess, I mean, I work with a lot of entrepreneurs, um, you know, sort of usually family owned businesses, privately owned businesses, professional services. And it's really hard for the owner to actually let go to other people on the team who are those experts, who are the specialists. How have you managed that in your business? It was very difficult because when I went from my single family, where I was trading my time for my family, friends and hobbies, and I actually have some articles I've written in Forbes to try and explain this on the asset protection of single versus multi the accelerated retirement, accelerated returns, the inflation hedging, all these things. But although cognitively it made sense to me, the trusting, especially having been very risk averse, like I have in the past, it literally took from the day I said, hey, honey, I'm not doing any more uh, single family. We got married in California, got married in Beijing. Over that period, I was studying, traveling around, meeting different partners and the beauty of the commercial assets is you can partner. There's enough meat on the mm-hmm. bone to find the right kind of guys. And you can find people with decades of experience in each specific area. But we met with dozens of partners that we didn't have the right core values. We didn't have the right mentality. We have long-term legacy wealth building. I'm looking for people that want to roll 1031 exchange forward, that want to build a, not big quick wins, flips, and big tax liabilities long-term sustained legacy wealth. 
And it's literally over and over and over. In fact, we were living in Hawaii during COVID and many times I was red eyeing out to look at properties, three of them in Houston one time and I went home with my tail between my legs <laughs> back to the rack. And just because of the combination of finding the right partners with the right deal at the with the right everything, it's just very difficult to find. And mm -hmm. I think the key is just really being patient. And the sooner that I learned to partner and how to partner, um, by we do background checks, we we uh, kind of date before we get married, and you know we, we do all kinds of things to. But the sooner I learned that, the better life I afforded my family because it mm. freed us up and it freed me up to do what I love to do and what I'm yeah. excited and what my superpower is, and I get to sit in a on a Zoom call nowadays <laughs> or in a room <laughs> before with a bunch of people that are doing what they love to do and they're in their niche and they're excited and they're doing their superpower and. When you kind of build that kind of synergy, that kind of energy, everybody lifts each other up in those rooms. I completely agree. I mean, we talk about with the EOS, you know, doing what you love with people you love. And mm -hmm. that is really about making sure that you are delegating everything that doesn't make your heart sing or where you don't add real value to the business. Because if you're doing the stuff that is you know, the $25 an hour work or the stuff that isn't the, the stuff that makes your heart sing, you're not really um, creating that energy that, that, that pushes the business forward. So please do that. How do you, how do you check for core value fit? Because core values is, is absolutely key in my opinion. And if you ever waver on those and, and, you know, sort take it to get the quick win you'll end up um, being bitten by it but people can present themselves in one way in an initial meeting and then you actually get to find out they're quite different in terms of where they behave so how do you test that core value fit for your for your partners for your staff for the people that come into partnership with you yeah it's funny but by the way just going back to your heart sing so here i am uh, uh, doing a podcast with deborah so could you hear my heart singing right now because here i am doing it with you so <laughs> yeah <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, I love I love doing this too. You can hear my, my, my yeah. Really I, I got your it. energy. It's really high. Um, uh, on that topic, I actually it took me a lot of growth to get my head off the grinding stone as a as an engineer to actually be able to get my name out there um, because yeah. I was just doing deals in the background and the over analysis paralysis also showed up in the the trust but verify but it was very difficult for me to trust partners mm -hmm. and. What I like to say is that some of my partners that have never been through a downturn have never been humbled and oftentimes don't even understand the questions that I'm asking. And I just did a, a presentation in Chicago about how, how could you structure deals in this economy? And I was speaking on the stage and I was people on a panel, people were asking me, I was like, well, everybody on this panel has been through a downturn. Those are the people that feel that know how to structure deals through these. And so I, I like to find partners that have been through failure. Mm -hmm. And you and and I can see evidence of how they were during failure, and and how they came out of it. I didn't go bankrupt. I could have, and I probably should have, <laughs> but but I didn't. I fought my way through it, right? As much yeah. as that you know sucked, and um and not that going bankrupt was bad. Many many people did, but I like to see and, I and like need to, see, to sometimes. Yeah, did they learn from that? Um, and yeah. how did that change them and shift them? And so when I when I present investments to individuals nowadays, I look to what questions they're asking. Right. First, what are your questions? Are they asking questions that that align with my core values? Um, and we look for capital preservation of our investors. Are they trying to squeeze every last penny out of the investment or are they first looking to how this will be stress tested? We call it or tested to survive natural disasters or economic disasters. Is it long term debt and fixed interest? How realistic, you know, giving them assignments like go figure out a rent comparable or, you know, seeing what they come back with, how realistic is what they're saying? Or are they just trying to just push this deal to a close? And that's part of it. The other part of it is we want to have a culture, you know, we've, we've had to, we've had to be, we've, we've been slow to hire, but we've been fast to let go because the problem is, is I'm very sticky. <laughs> there are some people in my team that have been there since the very beginning, but Yay. But those people are incredible. They have great hearts. They're driven. They're focused. They're self-motivated. But when you build that kind of crew, the people that aren't driven, self-motivated, and are a little more toxic, they stick out very apparently. And then it brings down the rest of the team. And so one of the best measures we have is to do a 30, 60, or 90-day sprint in the beginning where we bring them on. We get them exposure to everybody on the team. 
then mm -hmm. they get to feel like, well, once they start getting a little bit stressed, things start, you know, maybe something flips to, slips through the cracks and then maybe they made a mistake. How are they reacting to it? And, you know, those kind of things is that's going to be very telling when things do get tough. Things are hard, mm -hmm. when a mistake is made. And we're insecurities. Uh, it's one of the most litigious forms of loss. So we're very meticulous. But there's, I mean, there's a lot of ways, you know, that, you know, we'll, we'll test for culture, but those are some of them. Mm. I love it. And I, I love that whole slow to hire, fast to let go. And it's, it's the way you, you've got to do it is make sure you are really getting the right people on board. And as soon as you have an issue, you've got to deal with it. I mean, I, mm -hmm. I work with a lot of family businesses and, and, and as I say, professional services with multiple shareholders, there's often some people there who probably shouldn't be there and, and they sort of struggle with this whole, well, how do we actually let them go? And the reality is even if they're your uncle, your auntie, your, mm -hmm. your shareholder of 12, 10 years, if they're not in the right seat, they're not able to do the job, they're not, um, you know, sharing the same core values they are going to actually bring that business down or stop it from actually getting to where it needs to get to so I love it okay cool so you've you've written a book and, and this is what you know when I first read your profile this is what really got me so you mm -hmm. you decided to write a book about turning challenges into opportunities why did you decide to write a book and where did that come from well so one of my one of my colleagues Kyle Wilson said look I want to get a book together on a challenge pivot persistence pivots and game changers turning challenges and opportunities and I'm like well i I can resonate with that. And because, you know, I've, I've been going back and forth. I mean, I'm full-time real estate, private equity, and we're doing oil and gas investments now, which are all in alignment with our values. And we have this very clear path, but it wasn't always so clear. Right. And there was ups and downs. I was slaving away, just not nose engineer, and then trying to invest and losing it all. And then getting into single family, which was working, but then I was, you know, moonlighting and exhausted while getting two master's degrees. And I had to let go of that to marry my wife, right? Because I was not even dateable. But I was, and then I finally was like, well, okay, now I got to figure out something else that scales and partner and then a lot of personal growth. And then I got into multifamily and then I found this piece where, you know, I could make a improved living experience, a cleaner, safer, healthier, healthier life for my residents while returning incredible value to my investors and in a great community like yourself of great professionals. And, and so that ups and down journey was a lot of lessons learned. Kyle was like, that's great. Let's do it. Let's, let's, you know, and so, you know, I'm happy to give, offer a free copy to your listeners, um, persistence pivots and game changers, turning challenges and opportunities. And I had a little more hair on my head at that time. <laughs> that's not a wig. I actually had hair. <laughs> I was doing, my wife is doing my COVID cuts and um, one day she's like, it's all coming up. And then like a week, a month straight of that. And I finally let her shave it off and it's still off. So, um, <laughs> yeah, but uh, so I have that book and invest on mainstreet.com slash book is what that, and you can, I mean, if you use promo code Debra, um, then make sure to put Debra in there and we'll, we'll, we'll ship you a free signed copy. I believe in the, I believe in the content. A lot of great stories in there, a lot of things, and I'm, I'm happy to contribute how I can. I really appreciate the generosity. Thank you so much. So we'll put the link also in the bottom of the podcast feed uh, with the code so you can actually use that and get that. So writing a book, that's a bit of a different experience. How was that? Uh, so we had a writing coach. Um, so we had somebody on the sidelines, and I'm a technical writer. And I also write for Forbes, by the way. So I had some yes, warm-ups. I, I made, made note of that. So I'm actually going to mm. make sure we have the Forbes link in there as well. So yeah, we I have a Forbes author there. page. About a half yep. dozen articles on investing in commercial real estate. And it's all my passion, really, because I actually come from a family of educators. My dad's got three PhDs, and my sister's a PhD. And so I'm not the most educated dude in the family by far. I've only got two <laughs> master's degrees, I, you know. Um, but... So I, I really want to get the message out there. Like I said, I was in the grinding mill, slaving away as professional engineer, high tech, you know, beginner, trying to do it myself. Uh, and so I decided to get it all out there. And through Forbes, it's been a great platform for me to share some of the lessons learned and sharpen. Why is inflation a better hedge, right, for multifamily, mm -hmm. those kind of things. But from a whole story perspective, the coaches said, just get out there. Let's have a conversation. Get out there what you think. And all of the thousands of investor calls you've had, these people investing in your deals, get all the stuff that you want to share out there in one spot instead of a bunch of little snippets. And then, mm -hmm. so I did that and we started contextualizing it, organizing it. And then she threw a lot of stuff out that I was like, no, you know, I'm like, no, you can't do that. I like yeah, that. Yeah, but you know, the, think of what, what the path, you know, and she had this whole strategy 
it was very it was a very fun process and a lot of nights and weekends at Starbucks for you know getting all that out there but it definitely sharpened my vision as a result <clears throat> I feel like kind of like that next level of confidence and empowerment to go get my story out there as opposed to just you know sitting in the you know in the in the room analyzing deals and, and knocking them out yeah and I think writing a book is a little bit like business as well. I mean, like less is actually more. So I'm, I'm very, very guilty of why use three words when I can use 3,000 words to tell you a story. Mm -hmm. um, but in actual fact, you have to have real clarity, like you said, of what is the journey to write that book. And business is the same, right? You've got to have real clarity on what are the most important things, because if everything is important, nothing is important. So tell me, I mean, you obviously have done some work around, you know, what your vision is and your, your, your core focus and core values. Um, how did you get to that? Because some Sometimes getting that level of clarity is hard. I mean, I've heard you say the book helped, but how else did you actually work to make sure you could get really, really crystal clear on what was important in the business? Well, we're at the point now with 500 million in holdings and multifamily and uh, 200 in oil and gas. I think we have 300 some investors that are repeating here. We have a business that's moving along and I've, d I've done thousands of calls and I have, I can relate to both the do it yourself or I can relate to those people that are slaving away. And when I speak about our investments, changing the facts and figures of what the deal is to the impact that it has, because they're not educated in America specifically um, about any more than their 401k or maybe an IRA, or maybe they visit a financial planner. Those are all the same assets. And if you read my passive investor guide, it's all about diversifying into non-correlated assets like real estate and oil and gas. And ones that right now when real estate values are waning, oil and gas is going up. So changing my message and changing the focus. Now we have core values of everything's written in plain English. Like, and we have like this, this hypothetical dollar jar when like that's jargon, that's jargon because for so many years, it was nothing was understandable to anybody that we were saying it was what every other private equity firm had. But now we have this culture around making everything understandable, making the stories relate to to the come from of people that are professionals. We want to make an impact on their life. We want to we want to be the most relatable person in the room, not come across as the smartest person in the room necessarily, but the person that they understand. And, and that's probably one of the biggest is being drawn in by the need that we're making in the marketplace and then shifting our messaging as a company and our way of being around that is definitely what made the biggest impact. Did you have any help to kind of get that um, happening within the team or was it sort of, you know, how did you actually, because I think we're all a little bit guilty of it is that we are very, very clear about what we want, but the way that we articulate may not be easily understandable by the people around us. So how did you get that clarity with the team and get to the plain English? Like what, yeah, how did you do it? <laughs> well, so I, cause I write technically, I am a technical writer by, mm. you know, and, but so the, the first steps was writing blogs. The second step was working with Forbes because they will constantly mm. beat it down to something that's very understandable and pull out the technicality. And then yep. the sec third step was doing this book where I felt I got coached through that and can, my, my brain was forced to constantly rewrite in more and more and more fluid ways. And then we have two different uh, content writers and uh, I'll we'll sit there looking at our deal informations, our slide decks, our ads, we'll sit there and we'll brainstorm on the words and the phraseology. And some of those wordsmiths are just incredible because I'll say, hey, this is what this is supposed to mean and what it does for how do we phrase it? So we've got a lot of help in those kinds of things because there really isn't anybody else presenting the deals like we are so that they're as understandable as they are that we there's nobody like we're copying <laughs> it's like we're just trying to blaze our own trail and we're trying different co combinations of different messagings and about all kinds of very complex topics to address it okay Awesome. Hey, look, I'm, 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 we could probably talk about this all day long, but I am conscious that we're sort of coming to the end of the podcast. I always ask our guests to kind of share some stuff with us. And you've already shared some really valuable things about, you know, being slow to hire, fast to let go. Um, you know, the fact that you um, you get outside help to help with clarifying those messages and things. Um, we've talked about a whole range of things, but the three top kind of things that you would like to share that have really helped you either in your professional life or your personal life. 
Well, I think um, the first one I'd say is, is to partner up uh, in your investment career. Most of the, the financial IQ of America is stuck in these 401ks, IRAs, or maybe their financial planner. Financial planners are only doing correlated assets that are tax affected and inflation affected. And they mm-hmm. fight away from doing private equity investments that can actually change your life. But it requires a, a partnership uh, with other asset managers and fund managers like myself to make that happen. The sooner I learned how to do that, the more successful I came. And then built fa- the faster I was able to walk away from my high tech you know, job, right? The yeah. career. Um, the, the one thing is a, by Gary Keller, what probably incredible book that changed my life because there's so many things to do. Um, but what is the one thing and, and those few things that will make the big difference? I recommend everybody read that. Um, and I run every, the, probably the third thing would be that daily clarity moment. Um, I run every morning around this lake right behind me with my puppy nowadays. But yeah. <laughs> so we're in Hawaii. What kind, of, was, what kind of puppy do you have? We have a poppy on Pomeranian um, animal. It's a beautiful <laughs> and agility dog that will run me to death. It'll literally run circles around me the whole time. <laughs> wow. So, but that is my um, focus, kind of meditative. Um, I'll put on podcasts, self-help. But get prepared mentally for the day. So I start strong every morning. And I always recommend, you know, that somebody find that, call it 30 to 40 minutes of that daily way um, to then recenter themselves. Mm, I completely agree. And, you you know, you mentioned very, very early on the podcast that in the beginning, in the early days, you weren't getting time for family and friends and other passions. I know you've got some amazing passions, kite surfing, and I read a whole bunch of stuff there in, in your profile. Mm-hmm. So are you finding time for those things these days? I am now. Yeah. yeah and, you know, we, we are doing great. We've got great partners. We've got a great staff. I can finally trust in things to move forward. A lot of very focused people. My, we're actually having our first child in December. Oh, yay. Uh, the ambulance came to visit us with us for a few months during this time and from Beijing. So they're yeah. uh, they're here. Um, we have a couple months scheduled to go to Hawaii next year, which is kind of our, our happy place that um, it's better for me to be in Southern California for business. But for a couple, year, for a couple months out of the year, we can get away. And, and I, I do a lot of traveling. I've been through Europe and Asia pretty extensively in, in a couple of years since. And, you know, so we, we make it a point to focus on that quality of life and not just be, you know, chasing an endless gold pot of, you know, whatever. Yep. It sounds like you're definitely living the ideal life. And I think um, from what I've heard, you know, that all kind of changed once you, you changed how you were doing the investment and bringing those other partners on board and kind of letting go to people to do what they're really good at so that you can do what you're really good at. So mm-hmm. it sounds fantastic. Now, you're obviously passionate about helping people. Um, I, I can see that. I can hear that from what you're talking about. So how do you help people? How can they get in contact with you? Yeah. Share with us. Well, so invest on mainstreet.com, invest on main and then street.com. Um, mm-hmm. If you go to slash book, you can, uh, we'll send you a, cop- a free copy of our book. It's, I think you'll enjoy that. On our website, we have passive investments open, both in multifamily workforce housing and very recession resilient, low risk assets, a way for you to actually make money with inflation right now and protect yourself from interest rates. So we had those, those are about the best capital preservation, cash flowing tax advantage assets that you can purchase. And so we constantly are chasing to look for those very difficult to find investments. And so those are open. We also have oil and gas that allows you to get into a non-correlated asset where you can start hanging your hat on more than just real estate in the stock market where valuations are going up and cash flows going up. The future's bright in oil and gas drilling and the tax advantages are incredible for ordinary professionals. They take like 30, 75% of it off the first year. It's like getting a 30% return on your investment in the first year. So that that is one way that we help to kind of lift up the financial IQ and the portfolio of our of our investors. And if you're just interested in making some investments, but you're not sure where you're at or you're a landlord slogging away with tenants, toilets and trash and you want to trade out, set up a call. You know, I've got all kinds of feedback for you on my journeys and love chatting with uh, new investors, see where you're at. And you yep. can do that at investonmainstreet.com slash contact um, or email me at patrick at investonmainstreet.com. 
Fantastic. Hey, look, Patrick, you have shared such a huge amount of valuable information and um, I really appreciate, you know, sharing the book. We've also got, we're going to put the Forbes link in there as well so we can people see your your Forbes articles that you're authoring. Um, I just want to say thank you so much for your time this afternoon for you, this morning for me. It's been an absolute pleasure. And um, yeah, don't forget to go and check that out. So investment on mainstreet.com forward slash book or forward slash contact will give you those two things we've talked about. So Patrick, thank you for your time. Um, really, really appreciate it. Have a great day, Deborah. Thank you very much.